Good evening, Lake Orion. Welcome to History Now here on ONTV. I'm your host, Anthony Termina. Yes, it's been a while, but we're here today. All right, I wanted to share with you something that's been happening recently in the news, which is the ongoing situation between Taiwan and China. This has been happening for over, over about a half century now since the, since the beginning of the Cold War. Um, the issue with Taiwan and is it truly a country, is, it's been very controversial since World War II. Um, China has long viewed Taiwan as part of China, whereas Taiwan views themselves as their own country. And this has caused significant problems between the two ever since the formation of Taiwan back in the, back after the Chinese Civil War in 1949. Um, so I wanted to talk to you guys today about the cross-strait relations and, um, what, and what's leading to the tensions that are going on over the Taiwanese Straits, over the Straits in the, um, that borders China and Taiwan. Um, the, it, it was started in pretty much, it was prior to, you have to look at, you have to go back to 19. 10, 1911, during the formation of Nationalist China, who at that time was, after the Qing Dynasty, it was formed, the Republic of China was formed in 1911. There was always that fear of communism. The, at, that, at that point in 1917, 1918, 1917 in particular, the communists took over in Russia. There was always that fear that the same thing would happen in China. Now, it's important to understand at that time, China was not truly one very strong country. There was competition everywhere in China. There was, but the nationalists, or the KMT, was led at that time by Chiang Kashik, who, um, uh, when if if you've read my World War II articles, was often seen as was the leader of China during that time that during the time of World War II. Now, prior to World War II, Japan occupied Taiwan from the Sino-Japanese War, which happened between Japan and China in 1895, and which and Japan kept the country until or kept the island because it was not a country. Yeah, until the end of World War II. And on uh, October 25th, 1945, Japan returned Taiwan. And at the time, it was it returned to Taiwan to China, to the Republic of China. And there's always been controversy about whether Taiwan was truly was independent at that time. But Japan returned Taiwan, nonetheless, to China in 1945. Now, Mao Zedong was the leader of the communists at that time. And the Chinese Civil War ended up going in two phases. The first phase was from 1927 to 1936. And the second phase was from 1945 to 1949. Both of these were significant because at, that at the time, when Japan invaded China in 1931, there was, there was initially two wars going on at the same time. There was the one between the communists and the nationalists. And both Chinas, both the communists and the nationalists against Japan. Now, I want to talk about the first Chinese Civil War. In August of 1927, there was a communist uprising in Nanjing, which led to the creation of the Chinese Red Army. However, this uprising was mostly crushed by the nationalists. This was mostly happening in southern China. The common perception was that the war started in the north. This was not true. In the second phase, you could argue, was from the north because the Soviet Union was north of China. And um, they were also a communist government. But this one mostly started in, the, in southern China. The communist goal was to seize power by force. There was the Autumn Harvest Uprising, which was Mao's attempt. That was repelled by the nationalists. There were also wars with the warlords, other Chinese warlords as well, as I made mention. There was not 
a single like powerful unity in China at that time. There was actually three capitals. The main capital, which was Beijing, the, the communist capital, which was in Wuhan, and the nationalist capital, or the KMT, was in Nanjing. Now, as the men mentioned, the, the first phase of the Civil War ended in 1936, pretty much at a, as a stalemate. But there was problems with Japan. Japan invaded Manchuria, and as a result, Chiang Chai Kashyyyk refused to ally against Mao, or refused to ally with Mao, because they felt that the communists were the bigger threat. But that old saying, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they reluctantly became allies against Japan when they invaded in 1937. But the war also helped the Communist Party gain recruits and increase their, and increase their capacity, increase their sizes of, of troops. Now the KMT, after the World War II, were the occupiers of the Japanese occupied territory. Also, they had the stronger army. So when the second phase of the Chinese Civil War happened, the, the, Nat, the KMT had a much stronger army. So the, the Communist Party adapted a passive defensive approach, which focused on the weaker areas of the KMT and wore them down, wore them down, wore them down. And there was two campaigns that stood out. The Liaoshan Campaign in 1948 and the Siege of Changshan in 1949. And those were when the communists were, were lower on numbers, but they effectively beat the nationalist army. And the communists continued to gain throughout China and force the KMT to relocate to the island, which was Taiwan. Mao takes Beijing and officially declares it the People's Republic of China. And this was very important in the Cold War because in the Cold War, the West recognized the KMT, which was in Taiwan, the legitimate government of China. Whereas the Soviet Union and the Communists recognized the Chinese Communist Party as the legit government of China. There was also this continued state of war between the two Chinas from 1949 to 1979. They would also participate in proxy wars against the other. The communists would often try to take the island, but it was often stopped by the nationalists. The nationalists also controlled the straits at that time, causing problems for the communists in terms of trade from the sea. So sea, and one of the biggest trading comes from the sea. And if you have control of the sea, then trade becomes very difficult unless you do it by land. Obviously, for the communists, the Soviet Union was the biggest trading partner. For the nationalists, it was the United States. So it was also a proxy war between the United States and the Soviet Union in the further bigger Cold War picture. It's important to understand what the mindset were in for in terms of for the communists and for the nationalists for the communists it's the one china policy taiwan is very much part of china Ta taiwan is, is not a country they're a province there was an attempt of one country two systems approach like what, what happened in hong kong but that would never work out between taiwan and china in terms of the nationalist approach, we are our own country, we are a democracy. That mindset was very much reflected upon whom both sides supported. The nationalists clearly were supported by the United States. The communists were clearly supported by the Soviet Union. So there was, th there was three Taiwan Straits crises. The first one happened in 1954 and 1955. In that situation, the communists tried to invade from the mainland. However, they were unsuccessful, mostly in part because the United States continued to support Taiwan 
and viewed it as a strong democratic partner against mainland China. On March 3, 1955, there was the Sino-American Mutual Defense Treaty, which, ha which states the U.S. was to defend Taiwan against a China attack. This treaty would last until 1980. There was also the second Taiwan Straits crisis in, from August to December of 1958. Both sides fought to a stalemate, but there was first real fears of nuclear war between the United States and the People's Republic of China. There was, at this time, the United States considered using nuclear weapons against China, and China was about to use their nukes as well. So this was the first real fear. A lot of times you hear about the 1962 crisis in Cuba and um, about the potential of using nu nuclear weapons from, from Cuba, but that was not the first one, even though it's the most known one. There was one in 1958 between the United States and China. Thankfully, we did not have a nuclear war and um, both sides ended up fighting to a stalemate and resolving to a status quo. There were proxy wars between the two, as I mentioned earlier. There were incursions in Hong Kong, um, trying to the nationalists were trying to help Hong Kong keep their independence from the communists. At that time, Hong Kong was a British colony before Britain and China had an agreement where Britain gave Hong Kong back to China. The Korean War, obviously the Nationalists helped aid the South. Communist China helped aid the North. And then in Burma, or present-day Myanmar, where, again, the Communists were supporting, the, were, again, the Communists and the Nationalists were supporting the respective sides in Myanmar slash Burma. Now in the 60s and 70s, the West starts to slowly recognize the Chinese Communist Party as a legitimate government in China. Great Britain and the Netherlands recognize the People's Republic as a legit government. They, they started that early. That was, that was pretty early where they recognized the People's Republic of China. Um, there was also the big Sino-Soviet split, which was, I had covered that on History Now in the past, the battle within, between both communist powers, between communist China and the Soviet Union. So, and the People's Republic of China, in many ways, begins to ally with the West against the Soviet Union, especially after 1955 when, after Khrushchev, who was the Soviet premier, denounced Stalin, which greatly offended Mao because Mao very much respected Stalin and um, that drove, that caused a split within the Communist Party, which Mao wanted more influence, more control in the Communist Party and the Soviet Union was not willing to give it to him. In 1972, Richard Nixon, the American president, visited China. That was significant because it slowly but surely started to begin the United States officially recognizing the People's Republic of China as the capital or as the legitimate government in China. So by 1979, the United States broke official relations with Taiwan, effectively recognizing the People's Republic of China as a, legitimate, as a legit government in China. And it was at that point for the U.S., the mindset was to harbor the fate, to have better relations with China. And one of, the, one of the provisions was to break official relations with Taiwan. The communists wanted one China and to be ruled by them. So, however, the U.S., also has informal relations with Taiwan. And st it's called the Taiwan Relations Act, in which the U.S. sells arms, chips, does trade with Taiwan, 
and also will still not recognize that China controls Taiwan, even though they recognize China as the legitimate government, they still believe, they still will not recognize that China controls Taiwan, that Taiwan is its own entity, that it, it's, it's its own country. And, um, and, that, and that was important because the U.S. still continues to defend Taiwan to this day. Now, China also tries to interfere in Taiwan's elections, often favoring political parties who support the One China policy. There are several political parties who support better relations with the United States and the West, and there are political parties who favor relations with China, the One China policy. So China does try to interfere or influence elections in support of those political parties who support the One China policy. And this, again, this would actually lead to the third Taiwan Straits crisis in 1995 and 1996. The U.S. again supports Taiwan to prevent Chi the, the Chinese influencing the elections. China would perform missile tests over the Straits, trying to intimidate the Taiwanese to elect somebody that was that influences that was that was a influ that influences that favors more of China's liking. A ceasefire was again reached between both sides, and the status quo remained. Relations, however, remained tense, but some thawing began to occur, especially in 2008. There were cross strait flights happened for the first time. Family members from both sides. There was a lot of families that had family members, especially older families, that, as a result of the communist, in, as the result of the communists taking over China, many of those who did not want communism fled to Taiwan, but left family members behind in China. So there was the allowing of family members to see each other in certain cities. Tourism, they allowed tourism to travel between the two. It was further extended in 2012, but it was stopped in 2019 following renewed tension. In 2010, there was an economic framework agreement. There was collaboration on books, works, and education. Up to 30,000 Chinese and Hong Kong students were studying in Taiwan, in Taipei. About 7,000 Taiwanese were studying in Hong Kong which was at this point is now controlled by China rather than Great Britain. Both sides also share support on humanitarian issues like earthquakes. In 2008, the Suchan earthquake occurred in China. Taiwan sent experts and rescuers to help in the damages, to help, in the, the help with the damages, to help rescue civilians who were caught and trapped in, underneath rubble. So there was still, there was some, despite the government's having friction, the, the Taiwanese um, helped out the Chinese in humanitarian situations like earthquakes. However, there still remains that fear of a Chinese invasion. 170,000 air raid shelters were set up in Taiwan much of it to shelter the population. The U.S. continues to support Taiwan. The Trump administration allowed high-ranking officials to visit Taiwan, and that policy has continued under Biden, the Biden administration. In 1998, Newt Gingrich visited Taiwan, much to China's dismay. And just recently, in 2022, Nancy Pelosi, the current Speaker of the House, and Newt Gingrich was also the, spe a speaker, the Speaker of the House at the time in 98, but Nancy Pelosi traveled to Taiwan to visit the President to, and, and that, caused, that caused a lot of anger in China because, as I said, that policy of the one China policy. And there has been a lot of tension between the United States and China 
and part of that is definitely over Taiwan. There, it caused concern, especially for the United States allies, Japan and Australia, because China has recently built up its army again. It's gotten much stronger. It's got econom economically, it's gotten stronger. And there, there's really a lot of cause for concern that something could flare up. And it, it has a very much of a Cold War feeling. This time between the United States and China. This crisis is still ongoing at present. Um, it'll be interesting to see if a Chinese invasion ever happens of Taiwan, what will happen? Can the Taiwanese defend themselves? The mindsets of both China and Taiwan are significant. As I made mention earlier, the one China policy, Taiwan is very much part of China. Whereas Taiwan's viewpoint is we are our own country. We have our own trading partners. We are a democracy. What role will the United States play? The United States has made a commitment to defend Taiwan. We will find out what happens in the future. But the legacy of China and Taiwan always will remain a controversial one. It is very much seen as a regional issue. And China does not like when other powers invade or invade in their affairs. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see what happens with the relationship between the United States and China over Taiwan. And you know, it, it'll be very, I'm curious to see where it will go from there. Will tensions cool off? Because it really has a Cold War feeling between the two economic and nuclear powers over, over Taiwan. So we'll see what happens. All right, that'll do it for this episode of History Now. Um, have a great day, and see you soon, Lake Orion. Take care.